South Hills, I am excited to share some amazing news with you today. As many of you know, we were on a journey towards the end of 2022 to close a gap that was actually pretty large. And a few weeks ago, I shared with you that we brought that all the way down to $52,716.38. And we were so excited about what God had done in that short period. Well, I also wanna let you know that after I shared that number, someone from the church contacted me and said, we're closing the gap and they're writing a check for the remaining amount. I just want to celebrate and remind you that this is God's church and that God is in control. And I also want to thank you because of you. Not only are we impacting our local communities and seeing life chains happen right before our eyes, we're also impacting global communities. A couple weeks ago, I interviewed my friend Sean Kapoff. He is the CEO and the leader of the organization called One at a Time. We raised $8,000 to donate towards One at a Time so that they can bless families with filters for clean drinking water that will last 20 years. You have impacted 160 families in the country of El Salvador. South Hills, thank you. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your generosity. I want to read to you something that's on our offering envelopes every single week. Every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people an opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture in there that I also want to read to you because it's a powerful scripture that shows our heart, especially what God has been doing here in the last four or five months. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, it says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As we continue to trust God with our tithe and also trust God with our above and beyond giving, we are leaning in and letting God continue to make a difference in the lives of those that we are able to reach on a weekly basis. Does it seem like other people have all these close connections? But every time you put yourself out there, you just end up getting hurt. Ever wonder if you're picking the wrong people? Or if there's something really wrong with you? Maybe the smart move is to keep everyone at a safe distance, including God. Is it possible for you to feel confident, connected, and comfortable inside a real relationship? Okay, well, we're going to continue our series today, and have you ever felt, and I'm guessing you have, that maybe you felt like somebody kind of maybe ditched you for a better deal? You ever feel like this? This happens when you're young. This actually happens when you're young. Uh, you know, my, uh, my daughter, Piper, she uh, loves church. She's memorized verses. She invites all of her friends to, uh, to, to church, and she's a sweetheart. And she went out and she got her friend a uh, birthday present. And she was really excited. And so she wrapped it up, put it in a bag, and she was going to go to school. Well, she kept bringing the bag back, to, back home. And we go, how come you haven't given your friend? Well, she's not home or she's not at school. So I was like, okay. So finally, her friend was at school. She is so excited. She gives her friend this birthday gift. And her friend was like, oh, thanks. She says, well, open it. So she opens it. She goes, it's, it's the one I had. You remember you liked it? She goes, um, yeah. And she goes, well, do you want to go play? She goes, well, I'm with these girls. So, and so Viper's like, oh, well, then can I play with, with you guys? She goes, well, we already have enough people. So, and I remember she was so bummed. So I decided this is a good opportunity for Pastor James to have a pastoral moment with my little theological, theological uh, theologian, uh, Piper. So I sit to Piper down and I said, Piper, I'm sorry this happened, but God asks us to forgive. He asks us not to judge. And I'm sure this little girl's got a lot going on. And, and Piper was like, so am I, do you want me to pray for her? I'm like, yeah, pray for her. Yeah, that'd be good. That's good. And do you have anything else to say? And she goes, she was really thinking. And, and I'm thinking, man, this is going to be a really cool story to tell our church about just like the power and the awesomeness of, of a little kid in her face. So she, she said, I know what I'd like to say to her. And I said, great. And so I wrote it down so I didn't uh, mess it up. She said, quote, I think daddy will say, you're mean, and I don't want to be your friend anymore. Give me my gift back, you little turd. <laughs> so that wasn't, I was like, me, that's not really what I had in mind after our long talk of, you know, but, um, okay. Now, I felt bad for Piper, understandably, but I felt, to be honest with you, very bad for this kid. Why? 
Because this kid is learning at an early age, my relationships have everything to do with my status. And if you help my status, I'll like you. And if you don't, I really won't need you right now. And that's a very different, difficult way to grow up because you grow up thinking I need to use people to get ahead. I need to use people to, 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 to be more popular or whatever. Now, it just doesn't happen to kids. It's going to happen to adults. Maybe you've had a friend that you thought you were good. You thought we were all good. And all of a sudden, they kind of bailed on you. You're like, what happened? I thought we were good. Well, better deal kind of came along. Or, or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a spouse or somebody that you just felt like, what about us? I thought we were good. Well, something kind of better came along. Now, the deal is, and then we've been talking about this the past several weeks, when you do that with other people, you inevitably do that with God because how you are with people is inevitably going to bleed into how you are with God, okay? And it just, it just happens that way, right? You're, you're, if this is how you're acting with all your other relationships, of course it's going to bleed into how your relationship was with God. We see a very famous story about this, and it's happening here with Moses and the uh, Israelites, now, Moses takes, he doesn't want this job, by the way, but God taps Moses to free the Israelites out of slavery in, in Egypt, right? So he does this, but it's not long before they start kind of getting kind of frustrated. So in Numbers uh, chapter 20, it says this, now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness? What are we, uh, that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went uh, from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together, speak to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and, Ad, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm, struck the rock twice with his staff, water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. Now, I have seen this happen in ministry a lot, a lot, uh, what is going on here. In other words, God, you were great to get us out of slavery in the beginning, but you're not really what I need right now. I need something better. I need a better deal. And I've seen this a lot in ministry. I've seen people get really into church, really serious about their faith. They get really into that. Maybe there's a health issue where they just, I need to, you know, I'm going through a really bad health issue or a financial issue or a relationship issue or something. And they're, I need Jesus. I need this. And I need the, the hope of God. And they start getting really into it. And all of a sudden they meet a guy or a girl or they, their health gets better or they get the job that they wanted. Boom, they're gone. And then you start talking to them and you go, well, the Bible worked for me at that moment because I was really in a dark place, but these self-help books have been working better for me. I don't really need church. These other things are kind of helping me for right now. And it's the idea of, oh, God, I'm with you when I need you, but I don't need you anymore because there's a better deal for me. Maybe that works for you guys. It just doesn't work for me anymore because I want to get the better deal. I've seen this so many times, you guys. It happens a lot. That's just kind of like how we're wired is like, what is the best thing for me right now? I've also seen people where Moses was trying to make the Israelites happy. He's trying to make God happy. He's like, God, I never wanted this job in the first place. And he's trying to do, please everybody. And he doesn't get to take the, the Israelites into the promised land. I've seen this with, with fellow Christians. In other words, what, what I've seen is that they've kind of either changed scripture or modified scripture so that they can have a relationship with God, but also please everybody else so that everybody's good with them. And even if it means changing it up a little bit, I'm, a good, I'm good with that, but that just means that I want to be, still be good with you, and so everybody still likes me. Like, I'm going to kind of make everybody happy. It's the idea that God is this big, mean judge, and he really needs me to soften out the edges, you know? God's like, God's got such a kind of a bad reputation here with these people. So I'm going to, he's chosen me to soften up the edges to make them a little bit more likable so that my, my non-Christian friends might like him a little bit more. He doesn't need you to do that. The reason he doesn't need you to do that is because it doesn't get any better than him. He is the best deal you're going to get. 
In fact, he speaks to this. Jesus speaks to this idea. He's not some big distant judge waiting to bust people. It's not who he is. Look what he says here in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Then he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does that mean? First off, what's yoke? Does anybody know what that is? Okay. A yoke is a wooden centerpiece that you would put on two animals so that they could actually plow and pull things. Do we have a picture of that? <laughs> it's not in your eggs. No. So that's what a, a yoke is. It's basically, it's going to pull and plow things. And what Jesus is saying is, look, look, attach yourself to me and I will take on the burden for you. Why? Because to understand this passage, you have to understand what's happening at this time. At this time, the, uh, the people were really attached to not only the Mosaic law, which had 613 commandments, 613 commandments. On top of the Mosaic law, man made, the religious man-made people are standing, stacking on more rules to that, right? So the religious people are like, you know what? We also needed this, and we also needed that. And they're making that on there on top of that. It's just impossible. And what Jesus is saying is, look, this is crazy. No, attach yourself to me, and it's going to be what I did, not what you did. I am going to be able to take you. Attach yourself to my yoke. I will carry on the burden, and you just let me do the, the power lifting for you. It doesn't get anything any better than this. Now, some of us may already know this, but we could still be ashamed, maybe of our relationship with God, because maybe we don't want to offend somebody, or we think that they have a different view of God, and, and, and that, you know, we, we don't want to... We don't want it to seem like we're judging anybody. When if you're not judging them, it doesn't matter, right? But at the end of the day, it's about us now. And at the end of the day, we're doing these things so we can be liked by everybody so we don't have to be alone. Being alone terrifies us. I'll be whatever you want. I want to hold on to God because I really do believe in him, but I'll do whatever else you want me to do so that, that way I just don't be alone. I don't want to have to be alone. They're afraid if people really knew the real them that they wouldn't be accepted. And so they're afraid of that. They're petrified of that. You know, they're, they're afraid of, oh gosh, now they're going to they're gonna think this of me and then they're not going to want to associate with me or they're going to want to be my friend anymore. So I have to be whatever they want me to be. Have you ever been in that position? I've got to be whatever you want me to be. If it means you'll stay, if it means you won't leave me, if it means that I don't have to be alone, I'll do whatever you want. I, no, I don't want you to get to know the real me. You may reject the real me. I can't handle that. You guys want a good example of this? Talk to teachers. If you want a real good example of this, talk to high school teachers. They'll tell you. These kids are so petrified of not being on the end. They'll do whatever, say whatever, be whatever, as long as they don't have to be alone. As they don't, they don't, they don't have to eat lunch by themselves. As long as they don't have to be on the outside, they'll do whatever. It's not going to be that long before it's like, I'm going to make up an extreme example, but like, Let's say all the, all the kids, because uh, some sort of a, a pop star wore a purple duck outfit, so all the kids have to wear purple duck outfits to school, and they're going to be like, yeah, I got to do this, all right? So that way I'm accepted, and then I'm going to have like, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell the school why we need to do this, I'm going to fight for the rights of purple ducks everywhere, and they're going to kind of go that way, right? <laughs> Just because they want so badly to be attached to something else so that they don't have to be alone. Vic, am I right on that? He's a high school teacher. And so I'll do whatever. Just, I'll do whatever. I'll say whatever. Just accept me. Let me be part of what's going on here. And what we have to understand here, guys, is that we don't have to put on a show when you're a Christ follower. You don't have to do that because he's already picked you. The question is, have you picked him? Look what Romans says in 724. Uh, uh, I love what, what, what it says. Paul, uh, Paul, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. For a lot of us, we don't like to go to uh, deep with people because we're afraid they're going to find out our sin or they're going to find out something about us and they're going to reject us. and They're not going to like us. You know, we, we actually do this with God as well. I'm going to ask you a question and you don't have to raise your hand. But if you've ever prayed at church, I'm sure we all have, right? It's easy. It's easy to pray at church. Have you ever prayed leaving church? It's pretty easy. But let me ask you another question. Have you ever prayed immediately after you've sinned? That's not so easy. 
Listen, I went to a private school, so I had a lot of experience getting sent to the principal's office, okay? And so when I would go to the principal's office, I would always fix like, yep, that's right. I would always stand up in front of the principal's office, and what I would do is I would tell the principal all the good things I did, you know? So I go to the principal's office, and I understand I started the food fight, but here's the deal. I've been doing my homework. I've been doing this. I mean, so I'm giving like a resume of, and if you've ever noticed when you feel guilty that you've just sinned and you talk to God, it's much that way. Uh, hey, God, um, I don't know if you know this. I started tithing, which is, I know you, you know, it's cool. And I, I've, I've not missed a day of church in, uh, in like two weeks. I've went through two straight weeks. And you try to tell God all these things you're doing as if I've done enough good things. Are we good now? Can I cancel it all out now? Is it kind of even now? And what God's saying is it'll never cancel out because you can't possibly do enough good things to equal out the bad things. And what you don't understand is I've already paid that price. Stop trying to wow me and just be real. Just be yourself. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to judge you. Stop trying to make it all equal. And, you know, I'm sure that if we've ever been to a football game, we've seen John 3.16, and we all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave us only because we all know that verse. But what most people don't know is John 3.17, which is actually just as important. It says this, John 3.17, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Unfortunately, some fellow Christians feel it's their job to condemn everybody. It's not your job. It's not, God said, I didn't come to condemn it. I came to save it. What I want you out there spreading is the way that I can save this world, the way I can save them. I don't want you spreading me condemning them. You're doing it the opposite way. I want you to tell everybody how I can save them. It's not through your good works or what you've done. It's through what he's done. No matter what you've done, it's not going to equal out. It just won't. Look what the, the Bible says here in Psalms. I love this. It says, Psalms 18, 19, he brought me out into a spacious place and he rescued me because he delighted in me. Guys, so many of us don't believe this verse. We don't believe that someone could delight in you. Some of us feel so unlovable that we feel like nobody wants to delight in me. I've got to put on a fake facade because I know at my core and my, at who I really am, I don't believe anybody delights in me. God does. He actually delights in you. So what do we do when that happens? We become insecure and we settle for superficial relationships. I'm just going to put on a show for what you want me to be or what you think I should be, and I'll just do that for as long as I can, as long as I don't have to be alone. When we do this, guys, we push people away in an attempt for someone to further our standard or further our status. We end up pushing those people away, and we just kind of keep jumping from, from relationship to relationship. I mean, how many times have you guys seen this? Maybe it's in school or in the workplace. I've actually even seen it in church where you thought you were good with somebody. You thought you guys were in a good place. And all of a sudden, they ditch you for a better deal. Many have had this happen to us and we're kind of hesitant to let somebody in again because I don't want to be taken advantage of again like that. But to be honest with you guys, I do feel bad for those people because they the reason they're doing that, to be honest, I don't even know their story of whoever's done that to you, but I'm telling you right now, they don't feel lovable. If, they've, if you've ever been ditched for somebody for a better deal, they don't feel lovable. They don't. Because they feel like they ha their, their worth and their value comes from their status. So they become uncomfortable, even erratic. Look what it says here. Um, you might want to write or take a picture of this. We become erratic when we can't be alone, but believe we're too unlovable to let anyone get too close. We become erratic when we can't be alone, but believe we're too unlovable to let anybody too close. So you just, you know, you're like, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing that. And it's going to keep, you know, going, bouncing from relationship to relationship because I don't want anybody really to know the real me. Now, that's why I love what the Bible says here, what God thinks of us here in, in Zephaniah 3.17. says this, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you and his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but rejoice over you with singing. Have you ever read this verse before? God rejoices over you with singing. So for me, even when I blow it, I could just picture God going, I love James. He's so cool. I love, he's my little boy. You know, like he is rejoicing you over. Have you guys ever been in traffic and you're super angry, right? Here's what Pastor James's tip for you for being angry in traffic. 
turn the radio law out as loud as you can with your favorite song and start singing. It literally changes your demeanor, right? You're in bumper to bumper traffic and you're angry, but I'm like, any way you want it, that's the way. Like it changes your whole demeanor, right? It changes everything. It puts you in a different headspace. God is so delighted in you, even when you blow it, that he's actually singing over you. That's how stoked he is. That's how stoked he is about you, that he's singing over you. The thing is, when we don't see God like this, we see him as someone I have to make happy all the time, and that's just not who he is. He delights in you. He's also your friend. James 2.23 says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. This friend is never going to bail on you for a better deal. This friend says, you are the better deal. I'm going to give you my son. That's how valuable you are. Now, Maybe you've been hurt by a friend. Maybe you've been gossiped about or ghosted or um, maybe you've had a loved one leave you or like Piper, they didn't appreciate your gift. But this friend will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money, which again, goes, comes and goes, and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So no, you don't have to have fake relationships based on material stuff to feel important or have a title to have, you know, feel like you have a bigger status. Here is, God doesn't care less about your status. He can care less about your title. He just wants to love you. Now, for those people who have done that to you, I'd ask that you do pray for them. It helps you in actually forgiving them. It actually helps you. I'm telling you right now, guys, I know that we've all felt that sting because there's an insecurity about all of us. So we've all felt the sting of feeling like we're not good enough for somebody and it hurts really bad. And so again, we settle for these fake relationships. But with those people that leave you for a better deal, they're, they're gonna constantly keep doing that because they don't feel lovable and they're gonna constantly jump from relationship to relationship for whatever that better deal is. And I feel bad for them, but I get that it could hurt. Guys, this even happened to me at church. So it's not like we're immune from this stuff. I worked at a church and I had somebody lie about me and just to get a better job. Like it happens everywhere, guys. And I don't feel, I'm not mad at that person. I actually feel bad for that person because that person's going to do it again and again and again because they're still going to try to get some sort of a, a better thing. And I feel, I do, I do feel bad for them. Now, if you've ever been hurt by someone like this or if you've done this for a better deal, I want you to remember this. Adopt practices that reinforce that true closeness is being seen and liked as you are right now. The world will tell you as soon as you do this makeover, then you'll be lovable. How many of us love a good makeover show, right? You do this and now you'll be lovable. That's malarkey. This is live or on camera. So um, that's just not true. God says, I, I want to be close to you right where, exactly where you're at. I don't care what your bank account is. I don't care what name brand clothes you wear. I don't care how fat or skinny or tall or short you are. It doesn't matter. I want you right where you're at. You don't need to wow me. You just need to accept me and, and watch what I could do in your life. Now, some of you have, if we're being honest, you've, you've had a real tough time with this. May, I'm willing to guess that some, some of us in this room or watching online have had someone tell you, I love you, only to leave you for something better in their mind. They've said, I love you. I want to be with you. Better deal. I got to go. And it hurts because you have allowed another person to dictate your value to you. You've allowed another person to say, here's what I think your worth is. It's around here. And you believe that, which again is not true, right? I gotta really watch my language here. So um, here's the deal. God will never do that to you. He sent his son to you. He values you. He wants to, to, to always be with you. He says, this is how important I think you are. But I do have a message for the people that have done that too. Okay, if you're ever feeling this way. And it's a metaphor that I actually remember from uh, football. And uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about DeMar Hamlin how he, uh, he had a heart attack on the field. Everybody was 
praying. I loved it. It was an awesome sight to see everybody praying. It's great to see DeMar doing better. We were all praying for him, and I, and I really do love the fact that he's doing better. But what the NFL did was they said, listen, we are going to have the championship game because we're not going to finish that Bengals-Bills game. So we're going to have the championship game at a neutral site for the Chiefs and the Bills. And we're going to put it at a neutral site. Not even factoring in the Bengals, right? We're going to have a neutral site there. And they started selling tickets to the championship game for the Bills and the Chiefs, right? And the Bengals actually go into Buffalo and beat the Bills in the snow. Nobody thought they were going to do that. And I love what Joe Burrow, their quarterback, said afterwards. And it's a great metaphor for what we're talking about today. Do we have that? We talked about it yesterday, just that chip on your shoulder. Everyone talking about a neutral AFC championship game, not even thinking about you guys. How much did that motivate you coming into this? You better send those refunds. <laughs> That's what I want you to remember today. Because there are people that are right now or in your past have actively bet against you. They have bet against you in saying that their life's going to be good and your life's not going to be as good. That I've got the high life now and you've got the low life and that's how it's going to be. That I am better than you and you're not as good as I am. And they've actively bet against you and it's hurt you. A couple things. One, they will not dictate your value any longer. That, that day is done. Okay, that's not going to happen anymore. And two... Your message to those people who have devalued you and who have made you feel like this and who have said, I'm better than you and I am betting against you, your message to them today is, you better send those refunds. You better send those refunds. I know the plans that God has for me and they're for me to prosper. I am worthy because of him, because of what he's done. Not only... Am I not going to let you dictate to me my value anymore? I feel sorry for you. I'm going to pray for you because you don't feel lovable. I know I'm loved. I'm good. And you want to keep betting against me and talking about me and gossip about me and pretending that you're so much better than I am? You better send those refunds because I know how this story ends. I'm good. I'll be all right. Guys, the God of the universe says that you are the better deal. He sings over you. He's your friend. And he's promised he's never going to leave you. And he's never going to forsake you. Guys, if this is not something our world needs, I don't know what it does then. If this isn't something our, our youth in our high schools need to hear I don't know what else. You are valuable. You are worthy exactly where you are right now. But you don't know. I'm struggling with this sin. You don't think God knows that? He's God. And he says, you're worthy where you are. Let, come on, take on my yoke. Let me carry the load for you. Let me do that. So again, here's how we're going to close. To all the people who've canned you out, what are we going to say to them? Better send those refunds. You have no idea what God asked for me. I am just getting warmed up. Let's pray. Father God, I just, uh, I thank you, God, that we could be open and honest here, Jesus. I know that there's people here that have felt like they felt alone. Maybe they're feeling alone right now, God. They're feeling like, does anybody love me? Does anybody want me? I'm a good person. I, I could be a good friend. I could be funny. I could, I could have a, a good time. I, doesn't anybody care? Does anybody want me? Father God, there are so many of us that have spent time thinking those questions. What is it I did? What did I do wrong? Father God, I just thank you so much that you tell us you are the better deal. I sing over you. I love you. I think about you constantly. The God of the universe thinks about us constantly. And Father God, I don't want anybody in this room to leave here allowing another individual to dictate their value to them. Father, help us to see ourselves the way you see us, that we are worthy, that we are lovable. Father, I pray that through this year, as we see how the year unfolds, that uh, we're going to see some more of that. 
we're going to see some more of the examples that, that we're good. And for all those people that counted us out, God, I pray for those people. Because they're obviously hurting, but they're not going to dictate to us anymore. It's those days are over. So God, we just thank you in advance for what you're going to continue to do in your church and with the people here in your church. We love you so much, Jesus. In your name, amen.